Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Leon Surmelian. I am an arrogant Armenian. Armenian hova, yerik firatsova, sasunmuş bu bana, ay gagan hova, sasunmuş bu bana, ay gagan hova. Armenian hova, yerik firatsova, sasunmuş bu bana, ay gagan hova, sasunmuş bu bana, ay gagan hova. Tanıtatum mawan het. Introduction to Mortality. One morning, when I was almost eight years old, my uncle Harutun came back from Paris. He had a small pointed brown beard, like a French artist's, and a mysterious bundle of manuscripts, which I regarded with awe. It was the year 1911. Outside, the pomegranates were bursting with crimson joy in the gardens of Trebzond, and a warm wind blew from the sea. But it seemed that Uncle Hartoon was very tired and needed rest. My mother took him upstairs and put him to bed in a sunny room. He never came out of that bed. He lay there like, like Jesus. Sometimes I found him writing in his bed. I was half consciously aware of the fact that Uncle Hartoon was a poet. He made altogether an extraordinary impression on me. But in a few months, he was reduced to skin and bones. God did not call back the angel of death. Uncle Hartoon was the first person I had seen die. I asked my brother Onik, two and a half years older than I, many questions about death. Onik, do you mean to say that father and mother will die too? That you and I also will die? Yes, Zavin. Father and mother, you and I, all of us. Everybody will die someday. Well, I'll never die. <laughs> you think you won't. But you just close your eyes and die like the rest of us. But I won't close my eyes. I'll always keep them open. I'll never close them. Never. No, no matter how sick I am. Tell me, how can I die if I always keep my eyes open? Mm. I believed I discovered the secret of immortality. I want to be again Zavin, the child I was, the child I was in Trebzon, in the white red roofed city on the Black Sea that exists no more, but nevertheless will live forever. But I ask you, what can you do when the kids you grew up with are gone? Lost. I ask you, ladies and gentlemen, how can a guy forget his childhood? Haikakan Gyurimech in an Armenian village. It was the year 1914. I was 11 years old. As we rode down the street, we passed by our store in the center of Trebzond, Central Pharmacy, written in French, Turkish, Greek, and Armenian. Everyone patronized our store, even the Turks. My father was the best pharmacist in the world. He worked so hard for us, sent us to country resorts every summer while he stayed in the heat of the city compounding drugs. It was a full day's ride to the village for us. Mother, brother Oni, my sisters, Eugenia, Navart, our aunt, Azlin, our maid, Victoria, and me. My father had rented a cottage with a pear tree in front of the door. There was a merry round of card games, visits, table tipping, seances, hikes, and picnics. 
On Sunday afternoons, the peasants, they danced in the village square. Sometimes the men, they would crouch down on one knee and jump up, crying, Alashara! At last, father also came to the village, riding on horseback in his funny manner, his legs sticking forward. He was the worst rider in our town. Father was very fond of picnics. The fattest sheep was butchered for this occasion. And with our provisions loaded on two donkeys, we crossed a grassy plateau sprinkled with little globular flowers of yellow gold. It was from this plateau that I first perceived the towering beauty of our land, Hayastan, Armenia. On reaching our camping place, we children gathered firewood. The sheep was barbecued whole on an open fire. A man turning the spit, the lamb fairly melted in our mouths. At dusk, we gathered armfuls of dried ferns and made a big bonfire. We boys, we leaped through the flames. Yo! Father proposed, everybody sing! Come Armenians! Come Armenians! Let us march forward and salute again the Constitution. His voice, husky for much smoking, was terrible. Father was always the life of the party. Mother never spoke much. She was 13 years younger than he. With long brown hair and a milk white skin. An extremely handsome young prince had fallen in love with her when she was 18. Four childbirths and many shocks and sorrows had left their marks on her face. She could never forget the murder of her father and uncles in the massacre. No, oh, 20 years had passed since then. And now, at that picnic, as I saw her smiling, I smiled also. sang all the way back to the village with Roman candles in our hands, filling the night with fountains of sparks. We all knew the Turkish march. Long live liberty, fraternity, equality. Long live the people. Then all of a sudden, in the middle of the singing, an argument broke out. What do you know about international politics? It was father against Uncle Leon. Father was strongly for Armenian-Turkish friendship. Uncle Leon was an organizer for the Armenian Revolutionary Federation. Russian socialism will liberate our nation from Turkish domination. But father was critical of Russia and heaped his scorn on the Federation. It's destroying our nation. It's ruined our schools, disunited our people. Wasn't it all this revolutionary foolishness that caused the massacre? I did not know what socialism meant. I did not understand half of what they said. But it seemed to me father was right. He was too smart to be wrong. Father returned to the city. We continued our vacation. Yes, she said, Harry. And then suddenly, there was a war in Europe. The great Christian powers were fighting among themselves, and Turkey, backed by Germany, saw her chance of settling old scores with Russia and her allies, our friends. As if to signal the approach of our doom, there was a total eclipse of the sun at this time. Old women in the village shook their heads. It's an ill omen. May 
May God protect us. We returned home in September and found our city a veritable war camp. The schools opened as usual, but Trebzon was not the same anymore. Im Turk Kachengerners, my Turkish playmates. Our instructor of Turkish, Mr. Ohanian, was a distinguished looking man with graying temples and pince nez glasses. Our Turkish lesson that day was about the frog that talked too much. The frog said to the heron, Please take me up with you, friend heron. I am tired of living in this slimy water. The heron replied, Very well, friend frog. Hang on with your mouth to this stick in my beak. Take care not to say anything while we are in the air. Be sure to keep your mouth shut. I will not say a word, the frog promised. So they went up together, and the heron flew over mountains and fields, and the frog was delighted. But soon it forgot its promise. And as it opened its mouth to speak, it fell to the ground ah! and was killed. Mr. Ohanian took off his glasses and then wiping them with a silk handkerchief, replacing them on his nose, said in his magnificent Turkish, we shall next have an exercise in orthography. Suddenly, a terrific explosion shook the window panes. Mr. Ohanian looked through the window. I am afraid a munitions dump in the harbor has blown up. Another explosion, more violent. The Russian warships are bombarding the city. To the church, everybody to the church. And to the church we ran joyously. We imagined that the Russians were coming to save us from the Turkish yoke. I was in heaven, listening to the thunder of the Russian guns. Presently, a mob of hysterical women were at the gate. On our lead, our maiden aunt had come to take my brother Onik and me home. Onik, stop in, hurry, on our way. German army trucks, loaded with Turkish soldiers, roared down the main street. Buildings were crashing down all around us. It was a terrifying, yet glorious experience. But the Russian warships, they steamed away at nightfall. And from the balcony of a neighbor's house, we watched them disappear. The next day, both Turks and Armenians fled to villages. We moved to Zephanov, where my grandmother had an estate with two houses. It was a cold, rainy day in February. On reaching the village, we found both of grandmother's houses requisitioned by a prominent Turkish official, Ramzi Sami Bey. His wife was expected to arrive momentarily. Her name was Selma Hanoum. She apologized in exquisite Turkish phrase for the inconvenience that she had caused us because of my husband's official position. We have to live close enough to the city, yet out of reach of the Russian guns. Perhaps you could rent to us your larger house? She expressed a wish, patting me on my head, that Onik and I would play with her two sons. Shukri Bey and Mahmoud Bey. Both were fair, good-looking boys in European clothes. We'd never played with Turkish children before, but now we shook hands and talked like friends. We had no idea that Turks could be so nice. We boys played from morning to night. Onik, Zabin, Shukri called. Sabahanuz Hayir Osun! May our morning be felicitous! Sabahanuz Hayir Osun! We returned. Come on, let's play Tip Cat! After playing Tip Cat with them, we watched the Turkish recruits drilling on our lawn. The telephone rang. Shukri and Mahmoud ran to answer it. 
They said they had just talked to the sons of the governor general who was coming to spend a week with them. Their fathers were close personal friends. The guests arrived in the afternoon on horseback with a few orderlies. The three sons had mean faces. The youngest one was the meanest. We played marbles and knuckle bones, and he flew into a rage when he lost. I was willing to let him have his way, since his father was governor general, and our lives were in his hands. But I lost my patience. Give or dog, you can't talk to me like that. You don't have many more days to live anyhow. We will cut your throats. We will massacre all of you. We will not leave a single Armenian alive. I looked at Shukri and Mahmoud, hoping they would say it wasn't true and would apologize. They acted as if we were complete strangers. So it was true then. Don't say a word. Onik cautioned me. Let's go home. We were doomed to die. To be butchered, all of us. And all this time, our neighbors had smiled at us. I remembered our Turkish lesson about the heron and the frog. Keep your mouth shut. About a week later, a proclamation from the Turkish government was posted in the streets of our city. Dinimizin ve devletimizin düşmanı olan Rus hükümeti ile işbirliği yapan ve Türk hükümetin Our Armenian fellow countrymen having allied themselves with the Russian government the enemies of the state and religion and being in revolt against the Turkish government are to be deported to special districts of the interior and shall have to remain there for the duration of the war. We hereby order every Armenian in the province of Trebzon to be ready to leave in one, one week, June 24th to July 1st, 1915. Armenians from this day on are forbidden to sell anything and are allowed to take with them only what they can carry. No carriages can be supplied. If any Armenian opposes this decision of the Turkish government by armed resistance or otherwise or tries to hide himself, he will, he will be taken dead or alive. All those who hide in Armenian or give him food, aid, or shelter of any kind will be punished by hanging, whether they be Muslims or Christians. People discuss the order, and I listen eagerly. Where are they going to send us? To the Arabian deserts. We have to walk to Baghdad. But surely deportation is better than massacre. The next day, women sewed knapsacks as if they were going on vacation. We boys invaded the cornfields, slashing at the young corn and crushing it under our feet. We did not want the Turks to gather our crops. On that same day, mother received a note from father asking us to return home to Trebzon. The city was dead. Practically all the stores were closed. The streets deserted. We almost wept when we saw the shutters of our pharmacy drawn too. In broad daylight, poor father. They had taken his pharmacy away from him. Father was seated cross-legged in a corner of the divan in the living room. Hello, Father, we said cheerfully. <coughs> Tears glistened in his eyes, and he turned his face away toward the wall. I had never seen tears in his eyes before. 
he had become silent, shrunken, utterly broken man. Greek friends who might have been able to help us were scattered in various villages, but Dr. Andrew Metaxas was in town, and he came to see us like an angel sent from heaven. It was decided that one of us boys, Onik or me, should be sent immediately to the Greek monastery where he had moved his family. Well, send Onik. I don't want to go. Onik was disguised as a Greek peasant boy and went to monastery. He would carry on our family name if we all died. Father was too much of a realist not to see the situation and all of its inconceivable horror. The only thing he had taken from his pharmacy on closing it was poison. He distributed it to the women in the room sewed it in their dresses. Now, they had a means of ending their own lives before they could be violated. There is a gap in my memory here. I cannot recall how I was separated from my father. It was about four o'clock in the afternoon, and mother and I rode in a carriage. Where are we going, mother? To the American mission. your age in his school. I touched her char shaft caressingly, which being made of silk gave me a, a cool, agreeable sensation. And I kept looking to her face. Her white cheeks were more hollow than usual. Carriage rolled up to the mission compound. I'll be back in a minute, Mother said to the driver as we got off. At the mission gate, she bent down and kissed me on my forehead. Her lips were trembling. She tried to say something, but checked herself, held my face between her hands and kiss me again on my forehead. Go in, darling, and play with the boys. Before I could open my mouth, she turned around and she hurried back to the carriage. The driver cracked his whip and, and the carriage rode off. I wanted to cry, my ring, mother, and run after her. handkerchief to her eyes and her shoulders shook. I was never to see her again. I went in through the gate the mission compound was crowded with boys who had been brought and left there by their mothers, trusting them to the protection of the American flag, which flew on a long pole. In a few seconds, I underwent one of those profound inner changes that closed one chapter of our lives and opened another. 
I realized that my happy childhood had ended. Mahuan Janaparin on the highway of death. Shortly before dusk, a group of well-dressed Turks came to the American mission. They said Americans had no right to keep us. A gendarme, policeman, took us to a vacant Armenian house that was turned into an orphanage. I was overjoyed. I found Aunt Osneev, our maid Victoria, cousin Vardanush, and Uncle Karnit's younger boys, Michael and Simon. A few days later, a gendarme drove us out of the orphanage. Where are you taking us? Surgun. Deportation. We joined a crowd of terrified older girls, women and boys in the yard, bayonets bristling over their heads. Aunt Osneev managed to buy through a gendarme by bribing him a small tin box of English biscuits. The whole box was left to me. Nobody cared to eat. Layers of chocolate and cream and, and fruity flavors in them. It was almost worth dying to eat them, I thought. Nothing can destroy your appetite. Your stomach has the cat's seven souls, Aunt Osneev said with a sad smile. We were lined up in the yard, then like a funeral procession, surrounded by gendarmes with fixed bayonets. I came out of the compound and walked slowly through the streets. Although I was not hungry, I thought I might as well eat all the biscuits in the box before I died. Oh, we passed by the American consulate, and I looked longingly at the stars and stripes. Keep moving! A gendarme ordered us angrily. After about an hour, we were ordered to stop. They lined us up along the road and robbed us one by one. The sun it baked my bare head, and having eaten all the biscuits in the box, I was very thirsty. One perspiring heavy woman who shuffled along in house slippers slumped down on a rock. Get up! A gendarme ordered her angrily. You might as well shoot me now. The gendarme stood by her while the rest of us trudged on. The road made a turn and we could not see them anymore. the shots. They let us rest for a while on a marshy ground. We were not allowed to go near the river and had to drink the water of stagnant pools swarming with tadpoles. I kept dipping my biscuit box in a slimy pond and passing it to the women and girls. Not long. After this brief rest, I saw a woman's nude body in the river. Her long hair floated down the current. Her bloated white abdomen glistened in the sun. I could see that one of her breasts was cut off. Further up, I saw another body this time a man's. And then a human arm caught up in the roots of a tree. The corpses became a common sight, but after I had counted 14 of them, Aunt Osneev scolded me. Zavin, I told you not to look at the river anymore. Some minutes later, when I looked at the river again, I saw a long, long band of frothy blood clinging to its banks, the exposed roots of trees and shrubs huddled around like blood-loving, blood-sucking red snakes. Don't worry, I whispered to Aunt Osneev. 
I'm praying that God will save us. Pray, my dear. Pray. I am praying too. from shame. After a roll call, we began our second day's journey to death. I kept marching farther and farther away from my home by the sea. We arrived in Jebizlik late in the afternoon. And here they separated us boys from the women and girls. We boys were to be distributed among the Muslims of the district, which meant we had to become Turks. I ran up to Aunt Osneev, although it was forbidden. She was weeping without tears, because she had no more tears left. Stay with Michael and Simon if you can. I knew I would never see her again. In Jebizlik, we boys were put on exhibit before the government building. Any Muslim could come and take any boy he wanted. I seemed to scare them off. Though I tried to look gentle and docile, Simon was barely eight, with bright red cheeks, a perfect oval face, and clever eyes. All the women wanted to adopt him, but he wouldn't go without me. We were told that those of us who found no Muslim guardian were to be deported. But I knew there was no more deportation for us. They would simply take us out of town and, and kill us. A group of prosperous-looking peasant women raved over Simon. 
and one of them was determined to adopt him. I told her we were brothers. I could not let him go without me. You aren't brothers. No, you don't even look alike. No, you had better let him come with us, or I will have you punished as a liar. Bala, be Allah, we are brothers. I vowed, calling Allah as my witness. Are you really brothers? Simon nodded yes, but it was the kind of yes that really meant no. However, he still loyally stood by me. I realized that this might be his last chance. But we are not brothers. We are only cousins. I told them and let him go. Six or seven of us were still left. Each seemed to be ashamed of himself, especially a boy who was blind in one eye. Nobody wanted us. Only the river clamored for us. I had to do something to save myself. I was determined to live. A mounted irregular rode up to the government building. His bashlik, or headgear, was pulled down over his eyes at the most rakish and murderous angle. A typical law's cutthroat, armed to his teeth. He who is drowning clings to the snake, says an Armenian proverb. For the love of Allah, adopt me. They will deport me this afternoon if you don't. He frowned darkly and stared at me. Can you be a cheta? Like me? Uh, yes, yes, offend him. My answer in military bearing pleased him. He measured me from head to foot. I like your eyes. I will take you. I went to the Comic Com's office with him, where the diligent secretary added my name to the list of those boys who had been Turkified. He took me to a tailor shop and bought linen underwear and a Laz costume like his for me. He named me Jamal. I could not bring myself to call him father. I wanted to like him. He was saving my life. But I could not. I hated him. The news of my adoption spread quickly. In the evening, a village bula came to see me. He told me he would have to circumcise me. Don't be afraid. It won't hurt much. I decided I would rather die than be circumcised. But if I had to die, I wanted to die after seeing the sea once more. Soba, Soba, the sea is sea. Trebzon, my home by the sea. I'll go there. I'll hide out in vacant Armenian houses until the Russians come. I was sure Uncle Russia would be in Trebzon sooner or later. Oh my God, where was I going? The whole country was a vast death trap for the escaped Armenian. They caught two brothers at Hamski Khoi, and I heard the Cheta who butchered them like sheep tell people about it. Their bodies jumped around <coughs> for five minutes after I cut off their heads. They didn't die immediately. Their arms and legs kept moving. I didn't have a moment to lose. I scurried away, glancing back now and then to see if anybody was following me. There were no lights, no sounds. I slowed down when I reached the open road, walking very fast, but not running. Walking now across a moon frosted land that was like the setting of an angel's dream. It stirred such a wordless rapture in me that I forgot the gendarmes, the chetes, the kaimakam. The fingers of the Pontic knight had woven a golden loom in the sky. And now I was not alone. The moon, it walked with me to keep me company. And when I stopped, she too stopped. And when I broke into a short run, she raced with seven leaves loose, meanwhile grinning and making faces at me. Jerry too was my mischievous shadow, which amused me with all kinds of 
monkey tricks. I seem to have been changed into moon stuff and shadow myself. The river, it sounded like an organ in the cathedral of the night, and it spouted fountains of heavenly pearls. But I remember the night that we took poison. The river had suddenly changed. It howled savagely, and nude bodies seemed to shoot upward with the spray, whirl a macabre dance, and then topple back into the rushing waters. I would look up at the moon, and by some magic, the night would again become peaceful and comforting. The stars faded away one by one, and the moon faded. golden forge of dawn. I felt I was witnessing the creation of the world. I marched rapturously through this grand festival of the morning, forgetting Jevislik and death. How good it was to be alive. The ringing thud of horses' hooves roused me from my trance. Glancing back, I saw a squadron of Turkish cavalry. Their long lances gleaming, I stepped aside. The Turkish officer bent down from his horse and asked me, Little countryman, how far is Trebzond? Uh, uh I, I don't understand Turkish, I replied in Greek, <laughs> shaking my head. They clattered away on their horses. The next traveler I met on the road was an old Greek peasant woman trudging along with her donkey. Kalimera! Grandma! Where are you going? Uh, uh, oh, oh uh, I am going to Karichana, my son. Well, uh, I am going to Karichana too. We left the open road and began climbing a wooded hill constantly on the lookout for the sea. I saw it presently from the top of the hill. Thalassa! Thalassa! The sea! The sea! The old woman smiled, not knowing the cause of my intense excitement. I was back home! In the beautiful world! Ha! For nine months, I stayed with the widow. Neighbors took me for a Greek peasant boy from another village. My Greek name, Yankel. Toward the end of the desolate winter, Russians advanced on Trebzond, and the Turks fled panic-stricken, burning their houses. On Easter Sunday, we had meat. The widow, having managed to buy a cow's head with her savings. For nine months, we had had nothing but bean soup cooked with olive oil for dinner. I devoured that cow's head. The next day, I went home to Trebzon. Duna <laughs> Urtsanatsem, the house where I was born. As I walked toward our house, it seemed to me I was going home from school, turning left. On the main street, I began to run faster and faster, pleading with God to perform a miracle and let me find my mother at home. I tried to assure myself that she would be there in the kitchen, that I would find everything at home as usual. I ran madly into our side street and stopped. It was overgrown with weeds. They came up to my waist. Doors and windows were shut. Our street was silent and still, like a street of the dead. Apparently, I was the first one to return. I walked to our house at the end of the street. The door was
doors open. Afraid to go in. At last, my heart beating fast. I enter. It was bare. Bare like the walls of a mausoleum. The dining room door. The living room door, the kitchen door, the drawing room door, all of which opened on the spacious hallway, had a vacant, fixed, bony stare, like eye sockets from which the living eyes had been gouged out. All the rooms were empty and dead. I stepped into my first door on the right. Nothing was left in it. Even the linoleum had been stripped off the floor. On rainy days, Onik and I used to spin our tops here, and Mother used to chase me around, try and spank me with her slipper, but she could never catch me. I fled to the living room. Here, Father used to write hundreds of French letters to his customers on winter nights, and Mother used to sit by the window and sew on her singer machine. All gone. I fled to the drawing room. My sister Eugenia's doll was usually on the sofa there. No, nothing. I ran to the kitchen. No, mother was not there. But I could see her boiling a cauldron of figs for our annual supply of fig preserve. I groped for some object to press to my heart, but everything had disappeared. I ran upstairs to the bedroom, the balcony, the bathroom, in my frantic search for something to keep as a memento of our house, but I found nothing. at the door of mother's bedroom and I caressed the glass knob thinking mother's hands have touched it and I clawed at the walls I wanted to strike my head against them in my anguish and rage the empty room stared at me with tombstone silence I ran to the backyard Even our chicken coop was gone. Meow! Meow! I heard a familiar sound. And looking up, saw our cat crawling along the backyard wall. Kitty! Kitty! He jumped down and came to purr between my legs. Oh, looking up at me with his dear whiskered face. Why did you all go and leave me alone? Oh, I have missed you too, I said. Oh, taking him up in my arms. Oh, he used to be the king of our storeroom attic. And all the rice and cheese-loving mice were in terror of him. But now, he had grown gaunt from hunger and grief. I did not want to leave our house. I wanted to stay there forever with our cat. But I didn't know what was the matter with my throat. I couldn't breathe. I had no place to keep our cat. And I was afraid if I stayed another minute, I would choke to death. I put the cat down and ran through the kitchen back to the entrance hall. He followed me, clinging to my leg, meowing fiercely. I managed to dodge him and shutting the door behind me. Staggered under the street like a person escaping from a house on fire. I won't close my eyes. I'll always keep them open. I'll never close them, never. No matter what happens. Tell me, how can I die if I always keep my eyes open? Ladies and 
gentlemen, my father was the best pharmacist in the world. When he came home to our house in the evenings, he took off his black shoes with elastic straps and sitting cross-legged on a thin mattress drank Rakim and declared to his family that he was an English lord. <laughs> we kids couldn't help but laugh with mother. It would be quite impossible for me to speak of her now. Ladies and gentlemen, I ask you, ladies and gentlemen, what can you do when the ones you love are dead and their bones lie unburied? years old. There was no home in Trebzone for me anymore. In our empty church, I found a pile of things that no one wanted. A photograph, a family picture, my family. I had proof. I had proof now to convince myself I had not always been alone. Not always an orphan. I spent the next few years moving from place to place while the battles between the Russians and the Turks played on. I was sent to Russia, then back to Armenia where I found my brother, Onik, alive, and my sisters, Eugenia and Navart, also alive. It was a miracle. But being orphans, there was no place for us to stay together. So we were separated again. Meanwhile, our country, Armenia, was cut up and consumed by the Turkish Empire. A small territory under the rule of the Soviets was all that was left us tiny bit of land consisting of mountains and arid plateaus with no natural resources. How could we build a new Armenia out of that? Eventually, I ended up in an orphanage in Constantinople where I found my brother Onik again with some 20 other orphan boys we attended the Armenian Central School. Monique was in the fifth class while I was in the fourth. We took care not to mention our murdered parents and relatives when we talked. I still cannot look in a pharmacy without seeing my father's face moving behind the prescription counter. And every time I remember my mother. Where are we going, mother? to the American mission. Why? The Americans will protect you, dear. Debbie America. America bound, dreaming of going to America. I made my plans accordingly, which I kept to myself. Not even my brother knew what was going on in my mind. But how to go to America? I had no money. It was 1922. I was 17 years old. One day a man came to the orphanage smoking a cigar. The Armenian Women's Club of Baghdad has raised it for the education of two orphan boys 
talented in the fine arts. It is their desire to send them to the best schools of Europe to perfect their art. Art is the only worthwhile thing in life. He listened to our musicians, looked over paintings, and announced his decision to send to Vienna a boy who drew the heads of Turkish women to study painting, and my brother to study violin. I wondered what I should do to attract some attention to myself. I needed friends who could help me go to America. For a while, I practiced running with the intention of joining the Armenian Olympiad, hoping to win a medal. I took boxing lessons, and I had to give up this plan because I was losing weight. I'd always been thin, but I needed 2,000 calories more a day than the meager fare provided. In my despair, I decided to pass myself off as a poet. Poets were respected even more than athletes and mathematicians. My immediate concern was to win the good opinion of the Armenian Agronomic Society, which from time to time sent deserving poor students to America to study agriculture. An agricultural poem. That's it. And here is how I became a poet. I sang to myself a Russian song about the Dnieper, which always brought me glowing visions of wheat fields swaying in the moonlight, the slow, broad, fertilizing flow of a great river. Oh, that put me in the proper mood. Seizing paper and pencil, I began my poem by declaring that I wanted to be the red poppy in wheat fields, a cup for the sun. And then I went on and described other things I wanted to be. In turn, a cricket, a rustic bridge, a country road, a village brat, the little silver cross dangling on the breast of a barefoot little girl. Somehow the words just came by themselves. I called the poem, My Wish. Copying it clean in my best handwriting, I mailed it to the editor of The People's Voice without breathing a word about it to anyone. The following Sunday, a few small boys from an orphanage ran to me with a paper. Hey! 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 Oh God, it's your poem! It's your poem! Huh. I could hardly believe my own eyes. Yeah. <laughs> there it was, on the front page for everybody to read. My wish! Ha! Then, the Armenian Agronomic Society noticed my poem, and others I wrote in rapid succession, glorifying nature and village life. I applied for a scholarship. I received one, entitling me to free tuition to the agricultural college of a rectangular state called Kansas which I had never heard of before. The society, the society also helped me get an affidavit and other necessary papers. And the American consul promised me a visa. Ah! The editor of the People's Voice invited me to lunch. Will you stay uh, in Constantinople? <laughs> we arranged for you to have a private room of your own. <laughs> with a monthly stipend? Oh, it will put you under no obligation except to uh, continue writing poetry. This was a tempting offer. A private room? A monthly stipend? No more orphanage life? No, I couldn't stay here in Constantinople. Constantinople was finished for me. I was going to America. Walking back to the orphanage, I could see the sun bleeding over the minarets of Saint Sophia, like the torn heart of God. I recalled with a pang that my uncle Haratun had also gone abroad to study agriculture that he was a poet and had died unknown of tuberculosis. 
Could I have doomed myself to the same fate as Uncle Hartoon? I thought, perhaps it's necessary to die in order to be born again. Supreme adventure. The great day of my departure arrived. I wore a new suit, the cheapest I could find in the Grand Bazaar of Istanbul. Unfortunately, it was not cut in the smart American style, and I suspect it was made of an army blanket. But my new shoes? Ha! Brown Oxfords with pointed toe ends, like the Americans wore. The only problem was that they squeaked like the wheels of an ox cart, so I'd walk very carefully. I shaved myself for the first time with an American safety razor, brushed my teeth with American toothpaste, having already begun to Americanize myself. I carried all of my worldly belongings in a valise of imitation leather, a few French and Armenian books, our family photograph, a few t-shirts, some clean underwear. I had in my pocket $29 in American money. $4 more than the minimum required by immigration laws. The ship on which I was sailing was owned by a Greek company that flew the American flag alone on the deck. I felt I was off on the supreme adventure of my life. I want to be again, Zavin. The child I was in Trebzum. In the white, red-roofed city on the Black Sea. that exists no more, but nevertheless will live forever. As children, all of us were great, all of us alike. We lived the same true life, spoke the same true language, though the sound of the words were different. As children, all the world is one. Perhaps, after all that happened, the peoples of the world, remembering death, will live a life of peace by becoming children at heart. That is my wish and hope. I stood there on the deck, and the cry of the sea, it now sounded like a mass piano concert in the moonlight. My heart is a hard red shield, I said. My heart is a star upon my breast, and my breast is the world. I'm sailing on to America, to the great future, on the raft of my thought. A lighthouse, the burning heart of the world, my guide through the starry night. Adi, adi.